I was born a couple of months before Pearl Harbor happened. Um, my family was very poor, Irish Catholic family. Um, I was raised as a Catholic uh, in Philadelphia, always living in row houses in an Italian Irish neighborhood. Um, I was always interested in art. I was an extremely shy child. I think this happens to a lot of artists and, and um, very much afraid of people and kept to myself. And so I would draw and draw my, you know, create your own private world. Um, because my family, so I, ke I kept taking art classes um, because my family was so poor when it was time for me to graduate from high school. I told them I wanted to go to art school and they said absolutely not. And you know, no one on either side of my family had ever um, gone beyond high school and most of them hadn't even graduated from high school. So um, it was sort of unheard of and then for a girl to go mm -hmm. You know, the college was unthinkable, so they said no. So I got a scholarship, um, and then I said, well, I got this scholarship to Moore College of Art, and they said, well, you still can't go because that, you know, you still have to buy books and you have to, you know, pay for transportation and that sort of thing. So then I got a job working as a waitress to um, help pay for my expenses and I went to college and of course after I was in there for a while my parents realized I was serious and some good might come out of it they um, um, started to help me and, and support me but I, I basically got scholarships um, all the way through um, because there was so much emphasis on trying to make something that would make money I, I couldn't quite bring myself to take our education um, but I took um, illustration, graphic design, instead because that was a money-making um, field. Actually working in advertising and kind of becoming aware of um, how people are manipulated, how people are influenced by the kind of images that are used on packages. Um, really affect my, affected my later work, and particularly how women are used um, in advertising. Well, anyway, we got the Morton Salt account, and we got it because of a U-band package that we had done about a year earlier. And so, you know, that's the way people think in advertising. If you do a package with a female figure on it, then the next company that comes to you says, we hire, we're hiring you because you're good at doing packages with women on them. So um, Morton Salt came to us and hired us and basically wanted me to redesign a pa the package. And the first thing I did was I took the little girl off the package. There's all been a little girl, gosh, since before the turn of the century, this little girl carrying a giant box of salt through this violent rainstorm. Um, and then, of course, the slogan is, when it rains, it pours. So they didn't like that, so I had to basically come up with a new little girl. And I did literally hundreds of drawings of little girls, um, different hairstyles, different dress styles, different shoe styles. And I, the board of directors of Morton, who were all men in their 60s at least, I was probably the youngest guy, was maybe in the 60s, would fly in from Chicago and I would walk into this room and hold up all of these drawings of little girls and they would make comments like well her hair is too long she looks like a hippie this was in the 60s um, the one that got to me was uh, don't give her puff sleeves because it calls too much attention to her chest now this is probably what an eight-year-old little girl uh, don't give her those kinds of shoes you know give her this kind of shoes so finally we came up with the right little girl who apparently they're still using today who had the right hair, the right dress, the right shoes, still carrying this ridiculously large box of salt through this monsoon. Um, and that was, it, it, it's interesting because I've met guys my age, I'm 44, who have told me about their fantasies growing up sitting at the kitchen table staring at the Morton Salt Girl about their sexual fantasies and in fact I had a friend who used to have uh, sexual fantasies when he was a little boy about the white rock girl, who's this sort of nymph sitting on a rock um, for a 
cola company, a soda company. And he always used to stare at the bottle and try to see if she had nipples on her breasts. And one day, I guess at the end of his block in New York, there was a giant white rock truck. And the, the wooden nymph on the side of the truck was maybe six feet high. And so he got so excited, he ran all the way down the street trying to see if he could get And he got all the way up to her just as the truck was pulling away. And she still had no nipples on her breasts. So I guess the thing that started I started to realize is how powerful all of these symbols are, how, not only how powerful the female form was, but how powerful colors are, how powerful any kind of symbol. So taking something and making it blue as opposed to making it red has a tremendous psychological impact on people. And I don't know if it was a reaction against you know, years of having to do things that had to reproduce, you know, had to be strong enough to reproduce. But the first things that I did were very, very delicate, were black and white, very, very fragile, very intricate um, pencil drawings. And a lot of it had to do with, with a sort of fascination with the skeletal structure of things, which you can really see out here in the desert. You know, I mean, it's not things are not sort of lush and overgrown. You can really see the structure of all the plants and in a sense even of all the animals too. So a lot of the drawings had to do with, with you know, the fascination of the structure, seeing the bones of things, seeing the limbs of things, seeing all of that real fragile structure. I think about that now looking at the paintings I'm, I'm doing you know, that even though they're very painterly and, and very bright, there's still that fascination with sort of cutting through the outer surface down to the, the inner stuff, which is something that seems to keep coming up in, in the work. And I, I guess I also thought that, in a sense, I was also afraid of color. I thought that I didn't know anything about color. I would sit around with artists and hear certain artists saying, well, so-and-so doesn't know anything about color. And I, you know, was always sort of presented as this kind of deep mystery, you know, color. And I thought, well, gee, I don't know anything about color either. So I continued working in black and white, doing these very intricate, fragile drawings until my first sabbatical, which was in Los Angeles. And I went over there, and I'd always been interested in film. Um, which again relates back to an interest in storytelling and narration. I, I love movies, I love to go to films. And so I, I went to UCLA to study animation and worked, did an animated film while I was over there. And um, while I was in LA, um, and I love Los Angeles, um, I just became so fascinated by their sense of color, which is sort of real flashy and trashy and tasteless. And I, I like that. I like, I like real flat out color. I, I guess I, I feel like it's something that's really indigenous to this country, even though in a way we won't, maybe we don't necessarily admit to that. But I, I, so I just finally just had to use color and I decided I didn't care if I didn't know anything about color, I was just gonna use it. And, so gradually, as I came back, the work got brighter and brighter, and um, I started using Prismacolor pencils, and then from there, pastels, and then from there, oil pastels, and then oil paint sticks, and finally, oil paint. So I, I sort of inched my way along until I finally just was painting in fairly bright colors. The film basically is, is sort of about the difficulty, if not the impossibility, of love in our contemporary society that is so machine-oriented and so process-oriented and so kind of anti-human. Um, it's a very interesting poem. It also uses a lot of, of um, I guess, what would be called double entendre, you know, words used in hardware imagery and lovemaking terms, you know, and so that 
that sort of flow back and forth between, you know, something very hard edged and cold and steel like and mechanical and something very um, fleshy and warm and human. 34, I say, is the atomic number. When you find 34 women with 34 grams of selenium poured into 34 places, the knees, the fingers, the ear hole, those delicate junctures of the pelvis, or oh, coming out of me as yards of piano wire, unplayed songs, dead keys unwinding. My brain should have been wound around the machine screw with a square head, or the machine screw with a round head or a wood screw, or a lag screw, or a set screw, but the hardware cannot compete with the software. The female series started because in working on the film, I remember there was a line um, in the film, something about that you should have 33 women, you know, 33 women with 33 grams of selenium poured into 33 year holes and it describes all of these different kinds of women and body parts and I began to think about different types of women and living in LA too of course you see all sorts of different types of women and I think that also related back to my experience in advertising um, of sort of stereotypes or archetypal you know women and so, yeah, growing out of, out of the experience of making the film and, again, my background, uh, and I'm sure going all the way back to my Catholic background, um, that, you know, that basically, you know, there are three kinds of women. You're either a virgin and therefore a saint, or you're a mother and therefore a saint, you know, or you're a whore, and that's it, you know. And so I... All of that became um, a lot of rich territory for me to explore. She is a magic killer beauty. Her face literally glitters. Her nails are scarlet and lipstick drips from her mouth. Old or young, she looks very made up, but she is not pretty, not a real woman. Makeup hasn't done the trick of making her seem girlish, docile, or correctly female. She has made herself up to be fresh, angry, and provocative. Because she makes the ugly faces of a real woman, she is uncommonly beautiful. So I think articulate really grew out of of my interest at that point in, in trying to <laughs> turn my focus towards real women. Um, I think the fascination with larger than life depictions of women, which still related back to the archetypal thing, continued in the Articulate series. I wanted to show women laughing, women uh, expressing tremendous emotion, even women being silly, um, to to show that that you know beyond this mask of perfection or this mask of beauty, um, there was something else. There was something that was very real. In their mask-like grotesqueness and ornamental beauty, the women become clowns, glitz queens, maniacs. This may sound as though Dugan presents a negative stereotype of woman, not so. The masks that she paints project a female reality of tremendous energy and attractiveness, which is brash and disturbing compared to standard conceptions of womanly appeal. Dugan densely overlays colors but varies their application. One face is a mass of thin, tight lines, as if currents of energy were streaking over the skin. Another looks as though thick dabs of powder and several blushers needed blending. Not only does each face look heavily made up, but by cropping it to frame eyes, nose, and mouth, Dugan brings to mind the ritual of applying makeup, the focusing on features, the face up close to the mirror. Her use of oil stick resembles a woman's use of eyeshadow, eyeliner, lipstick. 
But Dugan revamps the meaning of the painted lady, for as she makes up her subjects, she shows metaphorically that makeup can be self-creation and invention, the freedom to create one's own rules. Women, the bright, garish colors and violent application of the paint suggest, must do violence to the ways they are usually seen. The heads were very large. They were 30, 30 inches across by 44 inches high. And always I focused in real close on the face so that really all you got was expression. And you didn't get a lot of the sort of accoutrements associated with women that kind of tend to make them feminine, like earrings, hairstyle, uh, clothing. You just got the expression. And because the heads were so large and because I cropped in so much, it almost seemed like they were sort of bursting the confines of the frame. And I wanted that. I, I wanted a tremendous feeling of power. And they came off being sort of very loud. The colors were very bright. Like I said, there was an emphasis on makeup, sort of loud and glitzy and brash and powerful. Consequently, a lot of people didn't like that because it wasn't the way they saw women, which was sort of being refined, refined and contained, because they were not contained, they were not refined. Um, I thought they were very beautiful, but very often my idea of beauty is not, not a, a typical idea of beauty. Um, I went around and I interviewed women who um, buy art, sell art, make art, write about art. Um, so women museum directors, curators, gallery directors, uh, artists, of course, critics, and, um, and one car corporate art dealer. Um, and I asked them all the same questions. I asked them questions about the women's movement and the feminist art movement and how that's affected art today. Has it helped? Has it hindered what's happened to it? Is it still its own separate reality or has it been co-opted into the mainstream of contemporary art? Um, what it was like for them, you know, essentially working in an all-male field. Just a lot of different questions. And they all answered those questions and I edited the tapes and so basically did this installation called Articulate and the only installation of it that I was totally happy with was at the University of Arizona Museum where they did everything I wanted because <laughs> you can't always get that. So the whole room was painted very dark, a very dark gray. And um, the, the sound units which were uh, playing the women talking were also painted that same dark gray. And then just the paintings which were hanging over the sound units were spotlit so that these very large, very bright heads just sort of glowed out from this dark wall. And so you entered this very dark space with all these bright heads kind of coming out of the dark and then all of these voices talking at once. So it was like walking into a room where there was a meeting, you know, or a party or something going on where everyone was very excited and talking at once. And then as you walked around, because it just sounded like, you know, a muddle. When, when people get excited, their voice raises. And so you'd hear out of this muddle very distinct statements coming from the different women. So the more you were there, the more you had a sense of what everyone was talking about. And then, of course, if you wanted to, you could go up closely to each machine and really listen. People have said to me, is your work neo-expressionist or neo-figurative? Because those are the sort of current movements. And I think that they're very valid art movements and they grow out of German expressionism or the sort of original expressionism. And now they are the new expressionism and the new figuration. And I, I guess that you could say that my work was lied to that, but I, I really feel that it was the woman's movement that really affected those two movements of neo-expressionism and neo-figuration as much as the original expressionism that, that happened in Germany, in that women's art at a time when, you know, abstract expressionism and ultimately minimalism and you know we're, we're all the art was all getting so reductive and so intellectual um, 
something kind of more and more minimal and more and more reduced that the women's movement came along and all of a sudden they started dealing with the figure the words started to become more narrative more patterned using more non-traditional materials all this stuff that they're now doing in neo-expressionism and neo-figuration so in a sense i feel that the women's movement has affected those two art movements very strongly, whether they'll admit it or not. I mean, you could say that the women's art has been co-opted by those two movements. So I feel that I have been very much affected by, you know, art in, done in the 70s during the women's movement. If you make, go through the galleries in New York, for example, in the East Village or the more elegant places like Soho or West 57th Street, uh, you can see that Peggy's work is in tune with the times. But that's not because she's been tapping the times. It's because it's finally caught up with her. She's been there, going there. She's been going that way uh, for some years. And finally, uh, the kind of thing that's happening in New York is causing people to, to look a little more carefully at what she's doing. So she's benefiting to that extent. But Peggy, nevertheless, uh, is not standing over anybody's shoulder. This work is her own. I did a series before I did the Articulate series called, um, well, just a series of double portraits, and then I did a series called the Scream series. And in each situation, there would be um, portraits in a triptych or diptych situation so that people would be sort of, again, that whole relationship to the frame really fascinates me. And it, it, it talks about sort of separate realities so that, you know, one person would be in one box, so to speak, and another person would be in another one. And in a sense, it, it goes back to what I dealt with also in, in the um, screw film, that whole idea of uh, that kind of duality of, of isolation and communication. So, or isolation and relationship that no matter how close you get to someone, you know, you still function in your own reality. And no matter how close you get to their reality, you can't completely understand it just as they can never completely understand yours. And yet there are those moments of crossover. That particular uh, diptych uh, deals, of course, with a great deal of psycho, psychic pain that she's going through. Mm -hmm. Uh, in her personal life and you know Peggy and she's calm and she's cool and she's collected and that's her self-portrait over there she shows herself uh, in a in an extremely unflattering way but mainly screaming her lungs out and the whole series she calls her scream series and when I spoke to her about that series I pointed up the anomaly of how she appears you know uh, to anybody and the intense feeling that come out in paintings like this, reinforced by the uh, legends that are part of the uh, paintings themselves. And she said to me, I said, she said to me, yes, she said, I've been screaming for years, just nobody's been hearing me. Mm -hmm. So beneath that calm exterior, uh, as the paintings show, there is an individual of tremendous seething uh, feelings uh, who's able to bring it out in a very creative way uh, in in the art she has produced. When I started working on Punch and Judy, I decided on the triptych. Um, I had seen this great interview uh, years ago with Roman Polanski, who I, I, I admire a lot of his films. And he um, was, they were asking him about that real early film that I think he did when he was still in film school, Knife in the Water. Um, and. And he said that he wanted the film to be about a relationship between two people, but that the best way to show that would be to have a third person, sort of as a protagonist or someone to bounce off the, the two people off of, you know. And I thought about that um, a lot later, you know. And, and so in Punch and Judy, it, it again is about the relationship between Punch and Judy, but there's always a third character in there that becomes the sort of the foil or the character that they bounce off of. And in the first triptych, it's the dog Toby. 
Well, what was interesting to me is that I started painting this painting still before I had done any research on it. When I finally did research, I found out that, in fact, it's the oldest continually produced play in the world. I call it the myth of the charming bad boy. Um, and Punch in the story is sort of this great little anti-hero, and he kills his wife, kills his child, kills all of his friends, uh, kills the sheriff, hangs the hangman, outwits the hangman, and hangs him, and in the end escapes the devil. It's either the devil or the alligator at the end, but outwits the devil himself and comes out of it victorious. But he's really kind of a horrible person because he just kills everyone with his slapstick. In fact, that's the origin of the word slapstick humor. Um, is just beating somebody over the head with a stick until they're dead. But in a sense, Punch is really in a, a sort of archetype for, you know, for violence to women and children in a way, and, and, um, and how that's sort of viewed as charming, you know, or funny. And I keep thinking, you know, if there was a character in literature who was a woman, let's say, and who beat up men um, and drank too much and screwed around, you know, on her husband, would that be viewed as funny? Would she be charming? Uh, Judy is usually shown by Peggy as a fragmented figure. Uh, her head's not connected to her torso, for example. Uh, in the in the new lithograph, her torso is not connected to any of the limbs uh, or her head. But of course, in a in a very general way, what she's expressing as a woman is uh, is the separation or the distinct identities of a woman as a sexual figure uh, and a woman as a thinking human being. Uh, she puts that into images with incredible uh, perception and depth. Uh, I don't know anyone who does it better. There's one. I decided <laughs> Judy should have her day. Because uh, in the play, you know, literally Punch just gets away with everything. And again, I try to do it with some humor. But there's one that's called Jack Ketch Sings His Heart Out. Judy gains the upper hand and Punch capitulates. And that's a triptych. And on one side, Jack Ketch, who in fact is the hangman, is singing away and his heart is actually coming up out of his throat and Judy is larger and on the other side uh, in the right hand panel is is Punch who serves sort of just like this because his whole role of being the person beating everyone over the head of the stick has been taken away from him and Judy's in the center and her arms are sort of over she's larger than both of them she's sort of risen up her arms are over both of their heads, almost like in a benediction. And she's broken his stick. And I guess for me, um, and maybe that will <laughs> appease all the people who are terrified of feminists taking power, but you know, it's like she's, she's sick of the whole thing. She's sick of the stick. So she just breaks it. It's not like she's going to clobber punch. And he's sort of lost his role, so he's kind of trying to figure out what to do. I don't necessarily see him as a totally bad guy either. I think he's inherited his role. You know, Jack Ketch, who I see as having one of the crummiest roles in the play, is this poor guy who just has to hang people all the time. And so he's been liberated from that, too. And so I present him as this person who's kind of really a, a, a person underneath, and he's got this soul, and he's singing. Drunk with some pain turned into useful knowledge, for she faces us and stretches her arms towards the heads of two men, blessing them despite their ignorance. She has not been had, but the victor does not forget who tried to do her in. She is relentless, ever renewing herself, rising over and over in a new incarnation like some surreal bitch. There's also a theater box which has a sort of, it's like a retribution theater box and it's where um, the devil is in the center because at the end of the play, um, supposedly Punch avoids the devil, the final retribution, but at this one he does not. 
and so he's on one side and he's actually holding out money towards the devil who is taking it out of his hand you know and also in front of of him on the shelf of the theater box are these sort of gold blocks that are all falling down and Judy is over one side and she's sort of in the world of nature she's behind this very beautiful plant or growing up out of this very beautiful plant and berries are sort of growing out of her head and these really beautiful like leaf forms are floating out of her head over towards the other side and the title of it is um, Punch has the devil to pay Judy demands change <laughs> and it's it's about you know in a sense that finally it's been caught up with him except being killed by the devil um, his power in, in monetary and power structure terms are, is being taken away from him. So the blocks are sort of like symbolize the architecture of, of um, power structure buildings and large corporations that is all crumbling and he's also having to give his money away to the devil. Um, I, the more I did them, the more I realized, must be my Catholic background coming, coming out, that they are more like morality plays, or that my interpretation of them is more like morality plays than actually Punch and Judy ever really was. I, I think it had its origins in a sense, you know, or some connection to morality plays, but they weren't really morality plays. I mean, they were really just slapstick you know, entertainment. It's kind of an interesting polarity, though, uh, to take a puppet show and convert it into a series of flat paintings and then to decide to put it back in the context of a kind of puppet show because those are very uh, skillful stages. She designed those stages. They were built to her specifications. Uh, and so in those particular works, in a way, Punch and Judy and Toby uh, and uh, all of the other participants that appear and disappear in that series are cast back into the role of uh, puppets. If you look at the entire Punch and Judy series, for the most part, it's Judy who looks like a human being and Punch who looks most like a puppet. Uh, her range of, of uh, invention, you know, I'm one of those. Uh, three-dimensional boxes, there is an image of Toby the dog, who is really Jigs, uh, on the edge of the box. It's this magnificent small piece of, uh, of sculpture. Toby the, the dog is another full participant in this. Um, Toby is the only one in the story that Punch doesn't end up killing uh, among all of the people he comes up in contact with. So uh, often animals appear in Peggy's paintings as sort of symbols of animal nature, too. Uh, if you look at the more recent painted figures things, you see little animals there, a bird perched on a shoulder, a dog uh, stretched on a, on a leash. Uh, those are there, uh, on one level at least, to express, again, this whole idea she's been exploring, the, you know, the, the physical reality of people and their intellectual reality that some way to integrate these, uh, some way to deal with all sides of this kind of thing. So the animals have that uh, particular meaning. Also, by the way, sometimes they're just funny. Uh, Peggy has a, uh, uh, a very highly developed sense of humor. Probably when I talk about my work, it seems that I'm only interested in very, very serious things in my work, where in fact, the thing that really interests me, the thing that's always interested me, in art and movies and plays and literature is, is that edge between horror and humor. Um, that's what interested me about Punch and Judy. I think my work has a lot of humor in it all the time. And I think that that's what life is. It's that edge between, you know, you start to cry and then you start to laugh. Or you start to laugh and then you start to cry. And it's, and it's that edge that that's that life, in fact, is not a veil of tears, you know, and I guess I, I'm very philosophical about that, you know, that things are not that clear cut, that life is not laughing all the time, but it's not crying all the time either, 
you know, that nothing is, that everything in a sense is sort of gray, mm -hmm. you know, and not gray because gray sounds like it's dull, but it's like one minute it's red and the next minute it's blue and the next minute it's yellow and the next <laughs> minute it's green, that it's variable and it changes. Um, I'm accused in my work of, because I make, I guess because I make such strong statements, people have said to me, well, you hate women, you know, because you don't, you know, because I don't make them look pretty, you know, or people say, or you hate men because, um, because you, you, you paint so many paintings that have to do with females, so therefore you hate men, you know, where in fact I, none of those things are true, you know, I, I think I make strong statements about experiences that I've had or that I've seen, but to say that I hate this or I hate that is awfully simplistic, and I don't think life is that simple, you know, I, I think that you know, I mean, in a sense, it was like Punch and Judy, it's like we're all in this play together. <laughs> we all have our roles, you know, sometimes the roles are good ones, other times they're not. And you sort of roll with it, you know, and you go on with it, and you, you, know, you try to make observations, you know, along the way, which is what I think artists do. Um, but, it's, but things are not so clear cut and black and white. The Colored Figure series, which is, is a series of oil paintings, mostly four feet by five feet, of women's figures, I think grew out of several different things. I, I noticed when I was working on Punch and Judy that I became more and more interested in the depiction of the whole body. And really to say figure, I, I think maybe is not the right word, I think maybe body is is really the right word and again that that whole thing about how women have been presented in art and how their bodies have been used you know as the nude and in a sense I I I viewed them as being sort of eviscerated almost in a way that they're sort of women of smooth countenance and smooth skin um, presented in the same way almost that a vase would be uh, you know, an object of beauty or a form that presented certain um, problems and that certain formal issues were dealt with, artistic issues were dealt with through the use of the figure. That didn't interest me and I really wanted to sort of cut through all of that stuff and I think what it really got down to in a certain way was dealing with the kind of the inner stuff of a woman, the blood and the guts and the juices and the bones and and the sexuality, and not a titillating kind of sexuality, you know, not a playboy image sexuality, or not even a kind of allusion to sexuality that um, certain painters have dealt with in the past, but, but real female sexuality. And I think because of that, a lot of people view the paintings as scary, um, violent, um, anti-woman or anti-gan or anti-men or it, people seem to have very strong reactions to these paintings. Um, I, I think again it's because it, it takes a presentation of women that we've seen over and over and over again ad nauseum um, and, and not done that you know, and, and in a sense change that or twisted that or, or taken all of that layering away and really tried to, you know, look inside a woman, you know, and see what's there. Um, it's not that I tried to set out to make ugly pictures or to make women look ugly. Um, I think they're beautiful paintings in a way because they feel very real to me. 
And I think it's interesting, for instance, in these paintings that people will look at them and because there's blood coming out of a woman, you know, or because there's milk coming out of the breast, or because we can look through um, almost with an x-ray vision to the inner workings of the body, that many people, even critics, have assumed that um, violence has been done to these women. So in other words, it, it seems to me that we either expect women, the presentation of women's bodies in painting to either be, in a sense, these sort of eviscerated, perfect, hairless, bloodless, juiceless figures, or if we see any of that on them, if we see any evidence of blood or bones or juices, then we assume that they're victims of violence. You know, so that a woman is one or the other. She's either, again, I don't know, it almost goes back to the virgin whore thing. She's either perfect and unblemished, or she's someone who's been beaten up and probably deserve to be beaten up, <laughs> beaten up, cut up, whatever, you know. So uh, one critic in writing about the show uh, said something that I think was very true, and he said that in a sense how you respond to these paintings of women tells you a lot about how you feel about women yourself, and I think that that's, that that's really true. I think the paintings are very sexual paintings. You know, I think they're a lot about sexuality, you know, and I think that in a sense that's anathema. I mean, people don't want to, um, to see that sort of thing, or if they see it, they want it to be titillating, provocative, what I would call covert sex. Um, and if it's not covert, if it's, if it's a sexuality that's presented as something that's very primal and very natural and, and powerful, then that's too scary. What comes out in these paintings are these incredibly charged images. I can only think offhand of one equivalent in contemporary art, and it would be the work of Willem de Kooning. Not that Peggy's work has, is derivative in any way from de Kooning's, but I think her images uh, in the figurative pieces are as powerful as the, for example, women uh, images that de Kooning is so famous for uh, from the uh, 1950s. So there's no way to avoid uh, the meaning of a painting by Peggy unless you were to uh, turn it to the wall. You know, even that would have some meaning <laughs> uh, that you couldn't stand to look at it. It's like they're uncomfortable. If you know her particularly, they're uncomfortable because they literally come from her guts. Uh, this this very elegant, very intelligent, very carefully thinking young woman uh, has this incredible, powerful, uh, emotional life that she's able to channel creatively into her work. Uh, otherwise, I don't know what would have happened to her. <laughs> you know? But right now. Uh, she's producing, I think, some of the finer painting that you find anywhere in the country. This concept came to me of this woman rising up out of the ground, up from a grave, and rising through this rabbit. Um, the rabbit has all kinds of s symbols for me. I, I won't go into all of that right now, but um, um, obviously it's, it's a symbol of spring, it's a symbol of Easter, it, it has a lot to do with religion to me, it has a lot to do with sexuality, it, it has to do with, um, with a friend of mine who's now dead who is no longer here and that's part of the reason for, um, for the title, She Is Not Here. Anyway, I, I'm, I'm obviously very interested in surface and so I decided on the rabbit that I really wanted to build up the surface and I wanted to I wanted to at one in one way make the rabbit look very real and very believable and and in another way make the rabbit look like a stuffed rabbit or a ceramic rabbit completely unreal and 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 that edge between reality and unreality interests me a lot so I a lot of the surfaces are built up with with modeling paste Obviously, I like very bright color. 
Obviously, I'm interested in surface. I like building up surface. Um, I, I want the paint to feel really physical. I say most of these paintings are about 80%, 90% oil paint. In some cases, some of the iridescent colors are acrylic. I, I really love, obviously, iridescent and, and pearlescent paint. I'll also, you know, use things like these little fake rhinestones um, that are glued on the canvas. I'll use nail polish, and which is down in here, and glitter in certain areas to, to make something look like it's juicy or shiny all the time. The person that I painted is at a point in her life when a lot of her children are growing up and leaving. And so there's that sense of loss, you know, of, of sort of someone that you gave birth to and carried inside of you and nurtured, and now they're, they're going away. So there's something about that. Um, the woman's breasts are very large, and they're dripping milk still. She's holding a glass in one hand that's full of milk that has a little male figure in it. And out of the bottom of the glass are coming these, this, these golden sperm that are sort of whirling around her loins, you know, at the bottom. And at the top of uh, the picture, there's an hourglass that has a sort of pink, viscous material in it that's, that's running down, that's, that's running out. And she seems to be sort of contemplating that whole situation of, of time passing and, um, and fertility and, and non-fertility and all of that. The woman in the front is kind of, it was one of the first ones in the series, so she's not as transparent as some of the others, but you start to feel sort of all of the sexuality in her body kind of pushing through, her breasts sort of pushing through her dress, and again, milk coming out of the breast, um, the, you know, organs down in here, the ovaries, you know, the uterus, all of that sort of starting to push through so that she almost seems like she's kind of bursting out of her clothes at the bottom. Um, she has a hand that's trying to cover her face, but one of her eyes is, is pushing through um, the hand. And she's sort of looking back in the direction of the dog, um, and there's a blue line that connects to the leash of the dog. And I guess I see the dog and the other animals in the paintings as connections to some real kind of primal animal quality that we all have, you know, that we connect to in animals um, that I think we, we try to suppress, you know. And in a lot of the paintings, there's a real kind of dichotomy between the head and the body, you know, which I think certainly happens in me and happens in, in a lot of us where there's a, where there's a, sometimes there's a connection between these two and yet at other times they're very disconnected, you know, the intellect and, and, the, and the emotions or the passion. When Peggy Dugan paints the birth of love, Botticelli's chaste and ethereal Venus becomes physically real, an unromanticized woman who staunches the afterbirth flowing from her dilated vagina with a golden hand. Here, an actual baby has been born onto the black shell, and the father, or more symbolically, the voice of the patriarch in the woman's head, appears as a torso fused to her back, his arm replacing her arm. Coupling half of his androgynous chest with hers, together they have the multiple breasts of an ancient fertility goddess. A second baby's head springs like a wild jack-in-the-box out of the man's open skull. What for her is an overwhelmingly physical and experiential event is a conceptual birth for him. And he cannot allow her this exclusive province of knowledge. His hand removes one of her breasts as though it were a bra cup rather than an integral part of herself. Together they might find a mythic wisdom, 
but he would rather deform her than share this power with her. He does not see how much he needs her, forgets he has no legs to stand on without hers. It's a painting about a person who had a lot of very difficult sexual experiences when they were young that had to do with, with incest and rape and basically her body really being violated and sort of the suppression for many years of all of the emotions involved with being violated in that way. Um, and the strength that she gained from, from finally coming out and dealing with that and the way that she dealt with it was through her art, you know, by writing about it, you know, in, in her poetry finally, and then through that being able to confront the people who perpetrated this and, um, and actually being able to help other women. I present her in a very powerful way, particularly at the top, you know, the top of her body is extremely muscular and strong and her arms are up like this in a sort of fighting position, her legs are up, and then this whole bottom part of her body has been sort of ripped open, you know. But also, there's a sort of a child um, in there at one point, a sort of a birth that's come up out of this. And then there's a sort of very um, fiery and ominous male form, male sort of perpetrator over on the side, who's, who's very vague but, but kind of present. There's an image of a woman uh, that emerges in a number of her paintings, and I find it horrifying. Um, she, she comes on with these enormous shoulders and kind of a square head. Do you know the, uh, that image? Look for it when you see her work. Uh, it's a frightening. Uh, to me, I haven't, I haven't said this to Peggy, but I find I'm frightened and appalled by it. I was really uh, astonished by uh, one particular painting from this series because it was a it's definitely a self-portrait, you know. And the fierceness and of the imagery, it took me back, actually upset me. I saw it in her studio, and I didn't know if I wanted to see it again. It was a very, very powerful statement, made more powerful because I recognized he was my friend, you know, uh, depicting herself uh, in a crouching position. You may know the painting, um, with uh, torrents of what looked like blood coming out uh, from between her legs, and a face fierce and powerful and frightening. We see through her clothing, but not as a lascivious eye. We see more than such an eye would want, through the flesh, into the body as a process rather than as art would have it, an unchanging fact of sweet skin and gentle postures. She stares, sad and grim, and almost squats. No raving beauty, she ravishes with defiance. Her body does not contain itself, and her skin is not a cover-up. In some places we see to the bone, in others to the heart. Organs read as plump, squishy hearts, and the pubic area is another heart. All the hearts are bloody, bleeding hearts. She suffers heartbreak from being a cunt, a woman to her guts. Perhaps anatomy is destiny, and it is natural for a woman to be the victim because of her body. But perhaps anatomy is only anatomy, and because we are not used to seeing a menstruating female nude, we assume that blood is a sign of pain. Viscera are bloody, but we perceive signs of life as signs of violence and we mistake the figuratively eviscerated conventional nude for a real woman. Dugan puts the guts back into the body, which is substance and secretions, solid and fluid. Blood, bones, milk, tissues, tendons, eyeballs, fingers, cheeks, hands, hips, nipples, femurs, pelvis, shoulders, arms, thighs, thought in blue currents, Thorax, hair, neck, ear, nerves, membranes, water, juices, 
veins, vessels, clavicles, groin, gas, in a vaporous halo below the crotch, throat, jaw, breasts, lips. Dugan has done violence by taking apart the female nude in order to put together a body that does not hide its parts or functions. A bird, ancient symbol of the soul, screams in the woman's ear, and there is no flying away. Silver bones, silver tongue, the eloquent skeleton supports the integrity of the body.